the session on uh, image registration and image synthesis. Um, there should be nine presenters, and there's a few already who are hosts, so that's, uh, that's great news. <laughs> and uh, welcome this morning in uh, North America, I guess uh, uh, in the afternoon in Europe, so that's, that's uh, all good. Um, so there's a few of you presenting. We'll present in block of three. Uh, so the first one, we go in blocks of uh, orders of numbers from E4, E5, E6, 90 seconds each, and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll have a few discussions all together, and then the next block of uh, three papers, and then finally the next block of three papers. Um, so sorry, I'm, I'm Hervé myself, uh, and uh, Alyssa with, uh, with us together, together uh, presenting a bunch of papers. And uh, so the first one should be Matthias, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, and in contrast to last uh, or yesterday, um, the technical chair will chair the screen for the presenter so that we do not lose time for sharing uh, the screen uh, again and again. So please, uh, could you share the screen with the slides? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, the floor is yours, Matthias. Hi, everyone. I'm Matthias Heinrich from the University of Lübeck. And in this paper, we are rethinking the design of learning-based interpatient registration. And in particular, we aim to solve registration by segmentation. As you all know, there is a huge success of deep networks for segmentation of medical images. So we thought, why not leverage this for registration? And even better, without any manual expert labels. So we propose a novel integer encoding of spatial canonical coordinates. And that is trained with self-supervision using automatically generated supervoxels and a conventional registration algorithm. So at test time, our deep lab 3D segmentation network predicts those deformable supervoxels and achieves superior registration quality, about 15 percentage points better than direct regression. This also removes the need for pre-alignment. The code and data are publicly available at our GitHub multimodal learning, and I'm happy to discuss this in more detail in the Q&A or at my poster. We also invite you to participate in our Learn to Rec image registration challenge that is organized at this year's MECAI. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. So next, Hendrik, please. Hello, my name is Hendrik, and um, I'm leading the Brain Image Analysis Unit at the Riken Center for Brain Science in Japan. And I would like to introduce our work on image registration. And one of the big challenges that we have uh, is that we have um, marmoset brain microscopic images of various modalities that need to be registered. And another challenge is that we have a huge amount of images, so we need automation. And um, uh, so even if like a traditional approach like ANS uh, initially worked quite well, it sometimes failed and that is not really uh, practical for us because uh, it's a huge amount of data and manually correcting them and figure out what is wrong is yeah, impractical. So we came up with a, a hybrid approach where we uh, used a semi-supervised image to image translation in com combination with a, a traditional multimodal image registration. And since then, like for several years already, it works quite well. Um, our code uh, for the network is publicly available on, uh, uh, you can find the link on the paper website and um, uh, it's in PyTorch. We also have our very early TensorFlow version 1. something code. Uh, so if someone needs that, then just don't hesitate to ask. Otherwise, I will be around today and tomorrow and I would be happy if someone has questions, just don't hesitate to approach me and we can discuss the details. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, next one. Hi, uh, I think I have a slide different than this, but uh, if this is the only one. Okay, then I'll just- uh, Improvise with this one. Um, hi guys, my name's um, Zheng Yu Chen. I'm from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I'm happy here to discuss my work on uh, transformers for medical image registration. So traditionally, we treat deformable image registration as a variational problem 
where we have to minimize the cost function for each input image pair. But nowadays, the focus of attention has been shifted towards developing deep learning based methods because of their good accuracy and fast computational speed at the runtime. Uh, and these deep learning methods primarily rely on computation, sorry, uh, on convolutional neural networks, which cannot model explicit long range spatial information. But recently, transformer from natural language processing tasks have shown its potential on computer vision tasks. Uh, but unlike CompNets, transformers have unlimited size of receptive field, make the, making them good at understanding the conceptual information in an image. And we believe that this ability can be useful for image registration, where we need to find the pixel to pixel correspondence between the moving and the fixed image. Um, and in this work, we propose to bridge Vision Transformer and VNet for 3D image registration. We tested the proposed method on the task of subject to subject green MRI registration. And the results demonstrated that the simple swapping of the network used in Voxelmorph with the proposed network can produce better performance without increasing the computational complexity. Um, and yeah, and I'm happy to discuss any questions and uh, our code is publicly available online as well. Um, that's it, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so that's uh, all good. And uh, thanks a lot for keeping on time as well. So it's always funny to see uh, moving around from different continents, uh, different rooms uh, uh, in Japan, in, uh, in in Europe, and also that's that's always fun in those virtual conferences. We have 10 minutes of uh, roughly less 10 minutes uh, of uh, questions together. So if we, um, if we uh, could uh, start any one questions on one of the three papers. Just write your questions uh, in the chat. So there was one question um, for Matthias. Are all the sequences equated with the same patient position or could it be, uh, could it support a different positions? Thanks for the question. Um, so this work was on, on inter patient registration. So they are actually not the same patient at all. So there's quite, quite large differences in, in positioning. Um, and the, the really neat thing about solving registration by segmentation is that you also um, are pretty much translation or a fine transformation invariant. So you don't, uh, yeah, you can, you can assume that that works even if there's um, significant differences in positioning. Cool. I'll, I think I'll jump in as well. Matthias, I have a question. Uh, in the paper, there were uh, uh, super voxels. No? I guess you can explain it a little bit more. What what was, uh, like, those are pre-computed using an existing algorithm, which is uh, based on the uh, the algorithm itself that outputs a, a super a super voxel? Or I was curious about this. Maybe I'm naive because I haven't read the paper. Uh, that's that's fine. Um, so the super voxels, yeah, they just computed automatically um, just based on the image intensities. We chose just a single image as a, as a reference target. Um, and we used the conventional algorithm to transfer or propagate those um, segmentations from these super voxels to the other images in the training data set. So um, that's kind of our way around using actual anatomical labels, right? We have these pseudo labels that, that we can use or can get without supervision. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so there's another question for uh, E6, so Hyun. Uh, do you explicitly observe higher registration accuracy for large displacements? Is compute to computational cost GPU memory an issue with the transformer architecture on 3D images because you only use it on the lowest level and not on the highest resolution level? Yes. Um... Sorry, uh, I'll first answer, answer the second question. Uh, so, the uh, the compute, yeah. So with transformers, it can be computationally expensive. But um, so instead of directly using the transformers directly on the three D images, we first use two com layers to actually downsample with downsampling to actually like decrease the size of the uh, actual three D volumes. And then uh, for the first question, I mean. Uh, for I think we actually used the the vox, voxelmorph model directly, used the voxelmorph model, and in that model I don't think you can uh, explicitly do long uh, large deformations because the 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 deformation is basically regularized. Uh, if you want to do large 
deformations, then you have to apply a higher regularization. So um, yeah, so we basically we just test it. It's a simple idea. We just swap in, swap the uh, the network model with the the proposed model, and we observed the higher performance. But we didn't uh, really compare if there's a higher registration performance for larger uh, displacements. And, okay, thank uh, you. Yeah. Maybe a follow up question. What is uh, the benefit of using this um, virtual transformer uh, compared to uh, a correl correlation layer like an optical flow, uh, the optical flow architecture? The optical flow architecture, I I'm not really so, familiar. So, when you correlate all the pictures, uh, or boxes, pixels, boxes, whatever. So, I guess in that case, yeah. So, the like I described in the introduction, the, the advantage of transformer. Then the complex is that it's it, you can see for each layer of the transformer you can actually see the entire image right so um, if I understand correctly the correlation layer you can also maybe you can also do that I'm not very familiar with that but I I think yeah the the main advantage of transformer is just uh, just that you can you have an unlimited size of receptive field if you can use some other method that can do the same thing I think. Um, the performance should increase as well. Cool. I have a follow-up question as well. A very quick one. It's uh, diffeomorphic. Is the method diffeomorphic or not? Or uh, you... no, you have to increase the the regularization uh, parameter to 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 mm -hmm. to like make the field smooth. But it's so if it's in, cannot... in if you want to have something nice. Uh, I mean, biologically valid. Uh, you should smooth a little bit more than than usual. Right. Yeah. But there are methods like. I think for voxel morph, there's a different morphic uh, version of it, and you can simply just swap in the network model um, mm -hmm. with our That's proposed right. method. I think that that will produce different morphic deformation. Yeah. Okay, then maybe a question for Hendrik. Um, why do you use a registration chain, so registering one image to the other, and uh, not registering all image to one modality directly? Uh, because um... We, we have images that have been acquired in, from the same individual in a specific order. So like we first have a two photon image um, taken with a two photon microscope. And then afterwards, it's like moved to a different microscope. So it's a similar slice, but uh, because you mount it to a different microscope, it suffers from deformations. And then again, like for the nissel, like this uh, bluish one that you have seen, there's like it undergoes some treatment and then it's taken again. So each time we have some deformations and but we can assume that it we, it is a deformation, a physical deformation that have happens one after another. So we just want to undo it in a, in the same chain. Um, that's why we have this kind of uh, three steps in this example. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, maybe one last question, maybe, and then we are going on. Um, so there was another one for Matthias. Um, uh, how is uh, that was the, your approach? In, uh, how is your approach initially aligned? Rigid or fine? Um, yeah. Do you need uh, any uh, pre-alignment? Um, so in in principle, we we don't need this. Um, of course, the uh, conventional registration algorithm has to has to be able to deal with, with that on the training data set. Um, so as long as, as this works, uh, we are more or less um, in, invariant to, to translations and um, up to the degree that a, a deep network for segmentation is, is invariant to those uh, transformations. So you can um, increase the um, ability for it to capture those by, by augmenting the, the, um, the input images that have already these propagated uh, superboxes on them. All right, so that wraps up uh, all the three first block of three papers. So we can move on on the next three ones. Uh, E5, sorry, uh, E7, mm -hmm. E8, E9. And all the questions uh, that weren't answered yet can be answered later on the, in the poster session. Just go to the poster of the presenters. Right after E5, yeah. Yeah, right after yeah. the session. So hi, I'm Hannah, and I'm presenting the work which I've done together with Lasse Hansen and Matthias Heinrich. We present a new concept for learning image registration for multimodal unsupervised deep learning based image registration methods. As they don't have uh, 
uh, universally applicable similarity metric, um, we propose a new method. And in our method um, for registration of the image two of modality B to um, the image one of modality A, we want to estimate the rigid transformation between them. And to achieve this, we randomly generate an additional image three of modality B in every training iteration. Um, we thus create cycles consisting of two multimodel and one monomodel transformation. And the multimodel transformations are unknown, unknown and to be predicted by the model. And the random monomodel transformation is synthetically generated and therefore known. And from this, uh, self supervised uh, learning procedure can be derived that aims to minimize the cycle discrepancy displayed in the red box. And we include this learning concept in our method consisting of a Y shaped feature extracting CNN in the correlation layer. And we perform our experiments on abdominal CT and MR scans. And the results demonstrate an advantage of our proposed method compared to state of the art mutual information metric loss. And our results nearly match the result of full label supervision. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go on. Oh, uh, just realized I don't have the first page here, but it's fine. Um, so, right, uh, I'm, my, my name is Hua Chi Cho. I'm a, a researcher in the bi uh, Biomedia Group in Imperial College of London. Um, so, in this work, um, I mean, I don't have to go on with the, how great is deep learning for, for registration because we already have so many people talking about it. Um, the main advantage, I guess, for speed is you, you have, uh, you, you can train a model for, let's say, 20 hours and then you can run inference on a pair of uh, images um, for a couple hundred of, of milliseconds and that's really good and you can also achieve quite good uh, good accuracy as well um, so in our work we simply want to contribute some alternative and very useful components to the current deep learning uh, registration arsenal we want to make the transformation module a, a bit more parameter efficient um, and also smooth and diffomorphic by combining the neural networks in with the classic piece plans and free form deformation model and, and stationary, uh, stationary velocity field. We want to try to also make it more robust and more adaptable to other modalities. And we use the mutual information loss for this. Um, we also evaluated all these components very thoroughly on T1, T1 registration and T1, T2 registration on brain MRs um, and also cardiac motion estimation on cardiac MRs. In particular, we also took care to write everything down very carefully, uh, very carefully and clearly in our paper. So you have a very good point of reference for the future and it also made our code very easily accessible. Um, with this, I thank you for your attention and look forward to, this, to, to, to the questions later. Hello, are you able to see me? Nice. Okay, so my name is Joshua Asley and I'm a PhD candidate from the Polaris Lung Imaging Center at the University of Sheffield. Uh, in this work, we present the development and evaluation of a hybrid model and deep learning based framework for functional lung image synthesis of hyperpolarized gas MRI. Uh, so I guess most of you probably don't know what hyperpolarized gas MRI is. So it's a functional lung imaging modality that depicts regional lung ventilation with exquisite spatial resolution within a single breath. However, to generate these images, we, we require lots of specialized equipment and specialized contrast agents. So there are other ways of measuring regional ventilation, and these include CT ventilation imaging, which is generated from multi-inflation CT acquired without contrast or specialized equipment. So our goal in this work is to build a deep learning based approach to generate synthetic hyperpolarized gas MRI scans from routinely acquired non-contrast multi-inflation CT. We compare a common CT ventilation model to novel hybrid deep learning methods, which use a combination of multi-inflation CT and CT ventilation models as input and hyperpolarized gas MRI is the label uh, for regression uh, conducted using a VNet CNN. Uh, and we demonstrate that by leveraging the synergy between the deep learning and the CT ventilation modeling, that we can generate physiologically plausible synthetic ventilation scans that significantly outperform CT ventilation and deep learning only approaches. This indicates the potential for deep learning based regional lung function from routinely acquired CT scans without exogenous contrast. I only have the first page here, so if you want to see the actual results, you'll have to come and see me at my poster. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So uh, as a short reminder, please uh, write down your uh, questions in the chat so that we can ask them to the authors. Thank you. Um, and we directly get one to for uh, uh, A8. Can B-spine be incorporated into other transformation related tasks? Right, thank you for the question. Yes, um, of course you, it can. And um, one of the advantages of this is you can actually um, reduce the amount of parameters you, you need to, to parameterize any transformation. So we already have some collaborators in our lab uh, started to use this to reduce either the runtime of the model or the size of um, the, the, the model. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, maybe a follow up question. Can you directly apply your train ne uh, registration network on other data sets without retraining? Or so, for example, the learn direct data set, there's also a, a brain MRI uh, data set in it. Would that be possible or do you have to retrain your network for that? I think it's a common sort of problem for, for this uh, paradigm of, of uh, different registration. I mean, I don't think you can do that. So you have to try to kind of um, retrain your network on a new data set. Um, if it's even slightly different. Um, of course, there are some uh, domain adaptation methods out there that could try um, that we can try to make this work without heavily retraining everything from scratch. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, then a question for Hanna. Uh, in the minimization problem equation, the moving uh, image seems to be irrelevant and can be replaced by any other image. How is the method learning a, transfer, uh, a transformation from the fixed image to the moving image? Um, the moving image isn't irrelevant. Um, the model estimates, um, at one hand, the um, transformation from the synthetically generated image to the moving image, and the um, um, transformation from the fixed image to the moving image. And then by concatenating the synthetic transformation with the learned multimodel uh, transformation, um, you can get this minimization problem. Okay, thank you. Can you directly apply uh, your method uh, for non-rigid uh, or the formal bill registration? Um, yes, we did some preliminary experiments um, at this stage on 2D data and it seems to work, but um, the, rigid, uh, the rigid version of it is kind of um, good for uh, large displacements and um, for um, deformable, completely deformable registration, um, the model will get a lot more parameters, I guess, and you have to uh, apply uh, a kind of a regularization to the information field as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, then a question for Joshua. Um, uh, could you comment on the difference in spatial resolution between xenon or helium MRI and CT? Does this affect your model? Um, so yeah, so we only use uh, helium helium scans in this uh, in this work. So the, the data set consists of forty seven scans um, from three different diseases, and all of them are helium. Um, so what we do is we register the CT scans into the spatial domain of the hyperpolarized gas MRI. So yeah, if we were using helium and xenon, uh, the spatial resolution is often about double the slices in helium than there are in xenon. So xenon obviously has less resolution. So I feel like we would at least need to include that data into the, the, the training set for it to be able to, to, to map it at least. But we have done work in hyperpolarized gas segmentation and we've got segmentation algorithms that are invariant to the differences in resolution from helium and xenon. So I'd be confident that that is a potential here with the synthesis work with a larger data set that includes xenon. Okay, good to hear. Thank you. Um, then another question for Juan uh, does FFD make the deformation field smoother than a regular voxel morph? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess it's a bit more fair comparison if you think of voxel morph without the final layer. So if you do prediction to one half of the resolution and maybe upsample by linear interpolation, um, it's a bit, um, I think voxel morph in that setting can be also quite smooth. And But if you predict to all full resolution, it's also the smoothness depends on, on, on the regularization, I guess. Um, for FFD, um, you can get a sort of a natural 
um, smooth needs from the FT base func uh, basis functions. And you have also a bit more control over the basis function. Um, yeah, so in general, it in theory, it should make it smoother, but I have to say that in our experiments, we don't really see a consistent sort of smoother results based on the evaluation, but visually we do see a lot of um, smoothing effects, especially when you, when you use a larger um, control point spacing. I have a follow-up question as well. I really like the uh, the mutual information part. Maybe you can explain a little bit more the difficulty or the challenges. No, there's the differentiability. There was parts and windows, if I remember, to estimate or something. Maybe you in a short sentence, if it's uh, summarizable. Yes, yeah, so, uh, um, I have to say this is not a freshly novel idea because it has been um, it's been out there for a while. Uh, for deep learning, you specifically really need your, your mutual information to be differentiable to be to be able to do the backpropagation to train your network. Um, and people have been doing this uh, for uh, for patches as well. Um, but essentially, you want to estimate some prob probabilities of your intensity. And if you do binning for that, you're assigning intensity to bins, and that process is non-differentiable. So uh, if you're familiar with kernel density estimation, you then use that to replace the binning process. So each of the binning, instead of adding one, you add a, a sort of a smooth window over your spectrum. And that makes the process uh, differentiable, the estimation differentiable. Uh, in, in principle, that's how it's done. You can uh, go to the post and to see, uh, or maybe the paper itself to see more details. So this computation for every smooth uh, bin, or this, this is costly probably, no? or, or not? not, not it is much. quite costly, yes. Uh, even if you rationalize it, it's quite proper costly because you have to evaluate this bin for not even each bin, but each vessel or each sample pair. Um, so to actually make it less costly, um, or to save memory, uh, at least, we actually do spatially resampling. So that we basically randomly sample subsets of points um, in the volumes uh, at each iteration during training. Um, and then it, it turns out to be quite good um, that way. Thanks. A good summarization skills. <laughs> Perfect. Um, then another question for Hannah. Um, is it possible that uh, a multimodal transform or a deformation is learned that gives low, a low loss, but not a good or physical transformation? Uh, this kind of depends on the random um, synthetic deformation you choose. Um, we hope <laughs> that's not the case for our rigid uh, transformation problem. and. But to tackle this problem, um, we want to in future integrate an iterative learning procedure um, where we create the synthetic deformation by adding the previous forward estimation uh, to a smaller random transformation. And then we want to start weighting the random part and decrease its uh, impact on the learning procedure um, um, until it has reached the last iteration, yeah. But then you will make uh, the deep learning approach iterative again. So what is then the uh, benefit of your approach against a conventional uh, iterative uh, method? Um, no? In which context? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, uh, just uh, because when you do it iteratively again, um, we 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 plan to stick to the um, to this um, random uh, transformation um, thing, so um, it still minimizes the cycle discrepancy and not uh, the difference between um, the fixed and moving image. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Do you have one, Harvey? I have one, a quick uh, quick one. I was curious about the new modality, no, not the new modality, but the different modality that we used to, uh, the Helium, uh, I forgot your name though, uh, I'm sorry, uh, E9. Uh, Josh, that's really yeah, Josh. Yeah, sorry, Josh. Uh, I was uh, curious, like what's it use, the, the typical goal? Uh, is the, do we want to measure breadth function, find nodules? What's the, the real goal, uh, the typical goal of, uh, of using this modality? So it allows us to get regional ventilation. So often, you know, uh, kind of lung function tests and stuff, you can get overall global lung measures. Um, but with hyperpolarized gas MRI, you can have regional ventilation. So, for example, it has applications in functional treatment planning and functional treatment radiotherapy um, for like a, a avoidance of uh, ventilated regions of the lungs. 
so we can work out which areas of lungs are the most ventilated and then avoid the radiation dose to those areas. Um, and in Sheffield, where the uh, we, I think we're the only centre in the, the UK to use it clinically for referrals. So we get referrals from people all over the UK and we're the only centre that's able to do it because of all the equipment that's required. So the idea of generating something that's kind of correlated with it synthetically um, is something that we're trying to work on to expand the scope of being able to use hyperpolarized gas oh. MRI. Thanks, 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 Josh. Uh, yeah, that, that helps. Um, um, all right, thanks a lot. So that uh, concludes the uh, the second block. Now we're moving on to the third block of papers E10, E11, and E12, and uh, 90 seconds each. Uh, again, if you could uh, stick with the time, that would help us. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, so, uh, hi guys, uh, I'm Shibo, and uh, I'm from the University of Pittsburgh. So uh, we built a model that uh, concerns with the problem of uh, 3D brain generation. And uh, we have a couple of reasons to, uh, you know, do this task because first of all, uh, there's a high demand of uh, 3D MRI images uh, due to the, uh, you know, prevalence of deep learning in the me medical imaging. So we think it would be nice to have a model that uh, generates diverse 3D MRI image from random noise. Uh, and also we see the potential of uh, parameterizing the 3D MRI generation because our model uh, builds on an autoencoding structure. So maybe we can like parameterize the latent space to have, for example, a brain image with uh, uh, like a certain age or a certain gender, something like that. Uh, so there have been a lot of solutions to this problem already. Uh, for example, the normal GAN and uh, the VAE GAN. And so the problem with the normal GAN is that uh, it has a notorious uh, mode collapse problem, meaning that the generated brains are of one mode and uh, they're very uh, singular, uh, uh, similarly looking. And uh, for those models that actually solve mode collapse, like VAE GAN, uh, they actually have like artifacts or blurry problems uh, because they often enforce the latent space convergence like uh, too rigorously that uh, the, the mapping from the real image to the latent space is actually uh, uh, will lose too much information. So we decided to solve those two problems simultaneously by like adding a, a Wasserstein loss in the latent space and also a cycle consistent loss uh, in, in the entire pipeline. And uh, we our, our, our network is quite simplistic. We actually label every uh, layer, yeah, where you can see in the poster. And also, if you want to check out our code, you can uh, visit our GitHub page. It's in PyTorch. Thank you. Thanks, Shibo. Next one. Hello, can you? Uh, yep. Can you see me? Okay, great. So, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you here. My name is Lei Harwei, and I'm a PhD student at UCRA Medical and uh, Image Informatics Group. Uh, so deep learning based image denoising techniques can improve the quality of low dose computed tomography scans. Uh, however, a repetitive 3D convolution costs significant computation resources and time. So in this work, we utilize the spatial and the temporal, convolution, temporal correlation in CT scans and introduce the, an efficient neural network architecture to improve the efficiency to reconstruct high resolution CT images. So a full 3D convolution is replaced with our um, spatial convolution and temporal convolution to reduce the computational load. Uh, this this, the efficiency was further improved by the 8-bit quantization without much loss of image quality. So through our study, we demonstrate that our spatial temporal network reduces the training and inference time comparing to the baseline of that uh, with the full 3D convolutions. And we also show that the 8-bit quantization uh, uh, produce the outputs that have minimum perceptual differences despite the information loss of computing a 12-bit CT scan using 8-bit quantized network weights. So together, we achieved seven-fold speed up during the inference. The proposed spatial temporal method can be uh, potentially useful for a clinical application where the computation resources is limited. And uh, thank you for your attention. Looking forward to answering any questions. Thanks. Next one. Hi, everyone. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so my name is June and I'm a, I'm a fresh graduate from Imperial College London. Um, so our work focuses um, basically on the modality of retinal fundus photography and historically semantic segmentation of, of retinal fundus photographs has been, has been difficult, partly due to the, sort of the small size of retinal lesions, but also due to uh, the scarcity of manu manually annotated data sets, which of course is, is the case for a lot of um, domains in medical imaging. So basically the idea is to synthetically generate data that's as good as real data, um, along with the accompanying ground truths. So, and we can then train sort of segmentation models on the synthetic data. And hopefully the increased volume and diversity of the training data will improve performance on those downstream segmentation models. And then basically the way we approach this is first by generating semantic labels using a GAN condition on uh, disease severity grade, and then using a, a separate image to image translation um, GAN, we turn these semantic labels into realistic retinal fundus images. And basically what we found was that uh, by training on a mixture of real and synthetic, and synthetic data, we we're actually able to uh, increase the performance of those segmentation models. Um, it's quickly worth noting that this work actually pre presents sort of the preliminary results of my undergraduate thesis, uh, which I completed recently, and the full thing sort of includes a number of extensions on this work. Um, yeah, so thanks. Thanks a lot. Also, that uh, concludes the, the small presentations. So now the floor is open for questions, if you have any. Uh, there's one question for the, not the last one, but the before last one, E11. Uh, and the question is about comparing a spatial convolutions, uh, 2D plus one plus the time, to a separation uh, between, oh, okay, so, so spatial and then the channel, uh, Channel versions. Um, um. Mm, so, can you clarify the problem? Uh, so you do you mean like compare our method with the mobile net? I think the question was more about. Uh, yeah, that so the originality of your method, if I understand, is the temporal aspect. No, how to decorrelate uh, those uh, spatial and time, or um, yeah, yeah, probably around this uh, this this uh, this same idea. Then comparison of different uh, uh, networks. There's probably a bunch. Uh, mobile net uh, is mm -hmm. one specific. I don't necessarily know, but it's uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, we haven't compared with the mobile net. Uh, uh, so we only compared with the baseline, like uh, full fully three D convolution uh, method. But we are like looking forward um, to conduct this experiment in the future. Yeah. Is there a problem in the, uh, separating or decoupling the special uh, special dimension and the other the temporal temporal one? Uh, I don't think there's uh, any problem. It's just our like at this stage is our preliminary study, and uh, uh, we really want to focus on the uh, the original full full three D convolution and the uh, separation of two D plus one D channel. Okay. Uh, Matthias, maybe I misunderstood the question. You could, uh, if you want to clarify, or or just go in the poster session as well. But, uh, uh, there's a no, question I for. The... Sorry, I sorry. think I um, probably misspelled this. You were doing three D plus one D, um, and I was asking whether kind of you could do four D but then separate channels. But I, I guess you kind of answered that, so it's fine. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first paper, E10, one, one or two questions. There's one on the resolution or the size, uh, resolution of the output, uh, the synthetic ones, uh, synthetic images. Uh, so that's the first question, a quick question, I guess. Right, so, uh, so the resolution of the images are uh, 64 by 64 by 64. And actually a problem for us because uh, it, it's, it's the, the limit is, uh, generally, due to your GPU sizes, because we uh, we I like theoretically we can try this model on uh, like say 128 by 128 by 128, but uh, due to our GPU size, we had to train it on a much smaller scale, and we also do like a series of uh, image pre uh, pre processing, like clipping off the intensity space and uh, doing image registration, that kind of stuff, and regarding the like the uh, pathological findings. I'll say we 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 also tried our model with uh, like uh, uh, you know those those disease uh, MRI three uh, D MRI brains, and uh, we actually successfully generated uh, 
you know, 3D MRI brains with like lesions and uh, other kind of disease findings with it. So, yeah, I, I'll, I'll say we haven't uh, discovered uh, any limit on, on, on that aspect yet. If I remember as well in the paper that you were comparing the GANs versus some VAEs, variational autoencoders, uh, and you found out that the GAN version was slightly better, the VAE was creating a not so good images, a registration or... Um, um, yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering if uh, is probably the number of dimensions, if I, I quickly read the paper and I thought uh, uh, in the VAE, if I remember, there was 32 channels, uh, 32 uh, dimensions in the Latin space. Is this enough or not? Or what's your feeling on this? Intuition on this? Well, because well, VAE actually generate very, a very limited uh, latent space information because it, it generates a mean and a variance because that, that tells you nothing about uh, the original brain. So uh, that's like one of the main features of our model. We we generate uh, like a one by uh, 1000 uh, latent vector that we estimate will contain enough information of the original brain. So like theoretically, if you want a larger brain, you will have a larger uh, latent vector as well. Oh, so, I, so but, uh, what you're saying is like by adding more dimensions, it wouldn't necessarily help much more for in the VAE, I mean. Uh, no, we, 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 we think that it won't help EVA at all. Okay, at all. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks, uh, thanks, Yibo. Um, there's one, one, one question, sorry, for the very last one, E12, um, which is right, in fact, not the uh, image synthesis, uh, the synthesis of images. Uh, I mean, sometimes it can look funny, and and if it's uh, if it's uh, I mean, if it's a clinical uh, MD or radiologist or if you're a real guy, I'm not an engineer, has a, had had a look on the synthetic synthetic images. Yeah, so that's that's a great question, and it's something that we considered very early on. Um, unfortunately, for this particular work, we were not able to secure any expert observers, just sort of due to a lack of resources. But um, um, it's definitely important, um, not least because for one, like this would open up further uh, applications, right? For example, uh, training. You know, training ophthalmologists um, on synthetic data, which would be, uh, in, in that case, realism is very important. Um, and uh, another reason is that you know, with synthetic data, because you know the GAN will you know learns the distribution of the input data, like it could produce sort of spurious uh, artifacts um, in this in the synthetic data where models trained on synthetic data can overfit to sort of unrealistic features um, that are only present in, in synthetic data. Um, Having said that, I think really sort of the, the overarching goal here is actually to prove, uh, um, improve performance on segmentation models on test data. And kind of, I think that the fact that models trained on synthetic data um, actually do better on real images um, only uh, can be used as a kind of proxy uh, for, for realism, I suppose. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. Like, uh, I think it's a, a really important part of future work to ensure that actual experts and actual ophthalmologists take a look at these images and um, sort of give their opinion on them. Yeah. So thanks for the question. I have a quick follow-up question as well. So you're using uh, image synthesis, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that uh, the end goal is to you have more data, so that could improve uh, CNNs or whatever, I don't know, segmentation, whatever method. Have you tried that, or it's uh, you only focused on the synthesis part and not necessarily use those augmented data in uh, in your other scenario? Yeah, um, I don't know if my video is working uh, or not, but anyway, um, um, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So basically, the the whole you know the whole point of this work and the, and the way we're evaluating this work is by looking at performance on downstream models. Um, so in this particular paper, we looked at um, segmentation of one type of lesion only, uh, and we found that sort of mixing the real and synthetic data in the training set actually yielded an improvement in, in performance on. Uh, segmentation on real data only on the test set, um, which is which is good, right? Um, and then, sort of in future work, we extended this by um, uh, by also testing how uh, we could improve performance of classification models as well, since the semantic labels are conditioned on sort of disease severity, right? Um, which means we can also balance the classes in existing data sets, which is uh, also a big issue: class imbalance. Um, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I have to interrupt uh, this uh, discussion, but we have to get to an end. Um, I hope we can continue this discussion on uh, your poster. So thanks uh, to all the authors again uh, for this interesting work, for the nice presentations. Uh, it's good to see uh, yeah, at least some image registration and synthesis works here. Uh, I hope it will be getting more again. 
And for all who are interested in comparing uh, their image registration methods to other registration methods, please join the Learn Direct Challenge. Uh, you can find that on Grand Challenge. Uh, Matthias and Hannah already mentioned them. And yeah, for all the questions uh, that are still open, please go to, to the posters of the authors. The poster session is uh, or starts directly after this session, so please go to the rooms E, G and F, H and ask all your uh, questions uh, to the authors. So thanks for joining and yeah, have, have a nice discussion on the posters. <laughs>